Um, my name is Marina Benjamin. I'm a writer. And um, that's my latest book. <clears throat> it would be nice to stop the clock, wouldn't it? To have a middle pause in our lives <coughs> when we could take the time out to review where we are, where we're going, and perhaps even who we are. This middle pause idea was the subject of my latest book. It's a memoir in which I recorded um, the time of my life when I arrived at this challenging moment, approaching 50, having a kind of wobble, um, wondering where I was going, feeling as though everything I'd done was in crisis, up for review. It wasn't a pleasant kind of <laughs> feeling, but I thought that it was worth pausing and looking at those struggles and trying to come to terms with them, and most especially to see what might lie on the other side. The trouble with time in midlife is that we don't feel as if we have any. We don't feel as if we have a single minute in which to pause, let alone to reflect on the bigger picture of where we are in life. Instead, most of us feel as though we're on a treadmill, pedaling very, very fast, sometimes just to stay in the same spot. Another image that comes to my mind is that of dough under a rolling pin being spread ever more thinly to cover the very edges of our lives. Being a wife, a partner, a housekeeper, a career woman, looking after aging parents and growing children, helping out neighbors and friends. It's as if there's never enough time left for ourselves. In fact, all the evidence suggests that women in midlife are busier than they've ever been. Of course, there are lots of positive spins that you can put on this. Um, we are established in our careers at midlife and brave enough to dynamite them if we want to take a different path or choose new adventures. We are young enough still to have a good energy, but old enough to know how not to squander it or be reckless with it. We are young enough to be in touch with upcoming trends and to learn new skills, and old enough to tell apart the faddish from the genu genuinely useful ones. We have experience, we understand commitment, we can mentor younger colleagues, except this isn't how the story generally goes. Too often, we feel hurried along by time or blown along by it like wind whipping through washing on a clothesline. We feel out of control, we're firefighting, multitasking, trying very hard to hold it all together. I think one of the things that I felt that motivated me to write this book was just exhaustion. The exhaustion of living this kind of life. And I didn't really know, I knew I wanted something else, but I didn't know how to get it. And so I thought I'd better give it some time, think about it. The other problem, of course, in midlife, if you pause to analyze it, is the tremendous pressure culturally on middle-aged women to stop the clock. Not so that we can review where we are and change things for the better, but for the very purpose of holding back time, blocking it in the way that a, a, a dam holds back a fast-flowing river. This idea that we can stop time so that we can remain young. If you look at popular culture, for example, they would have us believe, or it would have us believe, that aging is all in the mind, that 50 is the new 40, that you're only as old as you feel. We've all heard these statements. There's something seductive about them, but I think they're pernicious and destructive. The other thing that we're told, and which kind of seduces us into thinking that we can hold back time, delay getting older, is the fact that in, in reality, we now share the same culture as our children do. We read the same books, we listen to the same music, we consume the same films and the same food, we eat at the same restaurants. Sometimes we even wear the same clothes. We tell ourselves we're not fuddy-duddies like our parents were when they were 50. Then there's surgery. <laughs> Pushed on us as an aid to this particular kind of what I think of as developmental arrest. 
we can plump wrinkles into non-existence, smooth away creases with Botox, lift whatever sags, augment what is lacking, <coughs> suck out the excess fat. And we can all exercise madly to maintain the kind of bodies that we had when we were in our 30s. This is a seduction. This is the new paradigm of middle agelessness, the attempt to stop time in its tracks. What it leads to, I would argue, is developmental arrest. Narcissism. It suggests that we can't grow, that we can't learn, that we need to stay exactly the same. And if we stay the same, then we can't move forwards. We're in a conundrum. So what I came to understand through writing this book, which is a very deeply personal book and very self-exposing, I chose, I thought that in order to speak to other women, I had to be very rigorously honest about what I was going through. But what I came to understand about my own midlife crisis is that time is not something out there flowing fast beside us like a river and carrying us off into the rapids. It's in us. It's the metric by which we accumulate experience. And it is the fact that what I learned was that we embody time. What do I mean by this, by this idea that we embody time? Well, if you think about when we're young, women menstruate. We embody a monthly cycle. We are tied to the lunar cal calendar. There is a rhythm to our existence. We all know it. We all regulate according to that monthly cycle, and yet we have to keep it out of the workplace. This is a man's world. You don't take that monthly rhythm into the workplace. You, you, don't, you ignore the fact at work that, that you have this rhythm. As we age, time changes our bodies. Our monthly cycles stop. We enter menopause. If you're like me, you enter it very suddenly. I, I had a hysterectomy. We suffer sweats, we have anxiety <coughs> attacks, we get insomnia, our libidos decline, our energies flag, we develop aches and pains, and we have to keep all of that out of the workplace too. Menopause is really the last taboo. Nobody talks about it, let alone says, make space for me, I'm menopausal. <laughs> <coughs> so I believe that we need to learn a new approach to time from what our bodies are telling us. When people talk glibly about age-appropriate behavior, they tend to overlook the very real sensory dimension of what I think of as embodied time. So it is my body that tells me that bungee jumping off a tall building isn't a good idea <laughs> at my age. Okay, whether I listen or not, that's beside the point. It is my body that tells me when I have been out in the sun for too long or when I've had too much to drink, or when I've spent too many hours online, or too long sitting in the same chair. It is my body that tells me when I might benefit from a walk, or time with the dog, or from a sugary treat, or a chat with a friend, a different order of task, some editing to cut up the writing, cleaning the house so that my unconscious brain can get on with <coughs> doing the interesting stuff. S <coughs> stored up, learned and cherished, this kind of embodied time and this embodied knowing, it signifies maturity. It is intuitive, deep knowing, embodied time. It belongs to the brain stem, not the cerebellum. It's time that's in the gut, and it's time that it's in the heart. The French writer Colette, who was one of the big inspirations for this book, who grew old, grew old very disgracefully, said, in one of her novels, when my body thinks, all my flesh has a soul. I love this statement. It's so simple, and yet it's so profound. And I feel that I know what she means. The message to me is that we need to embrace time rather than fight it. We need to move, let it move us and to let it change us and to let ourselves change with it. But what does this mean? It means acknowledging that women who reach 50 may not want the same things they've always wanted. They may not be as hungry for success as they were when they were 30. And if they are, then they want that success on their own terms. 
They may have more energy for nurturing others and may want to spend their energy on others than on themselves. They may want to slow down because they understand that when you slow down, you can see things around you more clearly. They may trust their intuitions and their experience more than they used to. It's becoming quite wide, widely known now in neuroscience that what we lose in cognitive speed as we age, we more than make up for in middle age, where brain synaptic changes in the brain mean that we become better at making connections and building bridges. I wanted to end by talking about the arc of life, which is often represented as a bell curve. Here's birth, here's death, and here is the peak. And the idea is that we climb up towards this peak, and then somewhere around midlife, it all changes and we decline. This half of life isn't mapped out for us. There are all kinds of models about how you reach your peak, what you're supposed to do in your 20s and your 30s, and how you consolidate in your 40s, when you're supposed to have children, when you're supposed to work, when you're supposed to stop working. And you get to this point where I am when I started writing this book, and I looked forward and I thought, there is no plan for the second half of our lives. Other than the baby boomer plan, which is you work, 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 then you stop and retire and it all falls apart. And it really does fall apart because people who adhere to that model of second half of life suffer depression and isolation, feeling worthless, they're not involved in society, they're not engaged. It seems like a terrible model of a way to age. And there is a way of looking at this arc rather differently, and that way of looking at it comes from the philosophy of Carl Jung, psychoanalyst, and he talks about the arc of life. It's the same shape, but it has a totally different cast to it. We still have birth and death and a peak, but what he says is you don't know. You can never tell when you're at your peak until after you've passed it. So don't even try and waste your time thinking about, am I peaking now? Have I peaked already? Am I still going to peak? <laughs> is, there, is there just decline ahead of me? Oh, God, I've peaked. Now I'm on the downhill slope. That's not how he, you look at it. So what he says is he compares this arc to the rising and the setting of a sun over the course of a single day. So in the morning of life, the sun rises and we grow with it, attaining a peak of maximum illumination, where we, we understand our capacities, we can see clearly. This is a wonderful, wonderful moment. But he says, you must never live the afternoon of your life according to the program of your morning. Because if you do, what you're going to see is darkness falling. It's the traditional model of decline. What he says instead is if you ditch the morning program for the afternoon of life, what you do with the sun's rays as you go into the second half of your life is you turn them inwards and you let those rays illuminate the inside. And what he sees as the program of the afternoon is a program of enrichment. And I thought that was an absolutely lovely metaphor for aging. I'm just going to end on a final note, which is what happens when you flip the bell curve And you have birth here and death here. And instead of a peak, you have a trough. <laughs> Does anybody know what this curve corresponds to? This curve corresponds to happiness studies. It's becoming, again, increasingly widespread across cultures that people in midlife arrive at a kind of trough of despair. Happiness levels, reported happiness levels, are lower between the ages of 45 and 55 than at any other time in your life. So we talk about midlife crisis, we talk about midlife blues. This is where we are, we're in the trough. And it does feel very dark and despairing in that time. But the great news is, is that people get happier when they're older. It's reported everywhere that, that this is the case. People in their 70s and their 80s report greater levels of contentment. 
So I don't know about you, but I think that we're in our midlife crisis. When we come out of it, we can soar up like rockets. Thank God for that. <laughs>